Okay, great. For module four, we will be mostly talking about meta-analysis. So the learning objectives for this module is to understand the key principles and applications of meta-analysis in pharmacogenomics. We will do meta-analysis and we do that to validate biomarkers across multiple studies. And then we will visualize and interpret of our analysis and the results we got from our analysis. Uh, we also have a subgroup analysis um, across tissues and uh, some other uh, factors across data sets. And lastly, Julia has added a uh, section about AI and the uh, mostly used models in pharmacogenomics in terms of AI models. Okay, until now, we were just looking at one data set at a time, or we were comparing um, two data sets at most, right? So for example, we looked at one gene in GDSC and we figured there is a correlation. Uh, it could be either in terms of correlation or concordance index, meaning we found an association between a gene and a drug. Now we need to validate it. I think Helena, that was, that was something that you were talking about yesterday, right? About validation needing to, the need to find it in other studies, if I remember correctly. Anyways, this is what we did today. Okay, so we find that in one piece at say GDSC, we want to see if we see the same effect in CCLE and GCSI, for example, two other pieces in our data set. And that's what we mean when we say meta-analysis. Okay, so what do we mean is that we, just like I said, we combine results from different uh, data sets, and that way we improve the statistical power of our analysis. So, we say we got a um, correlation coefficient uh, or concordance index from these three uh, P sets. Now we combine them through meta analysis to improve our, the power of our analysis. And I've seen them this a lot, especially when they want, say, a pharmaceutical company, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, they have a new drug and they don't have one-on-one -on -one comparison between different drugs, but there are studies that are comparing other drugs together and we kind of can uh, chain those comparisons and get an understanding of how this new drug is performing compared to those other drugs. That's also uh, one application of meta-analysis. We use it to increase the power of analysis our analysis, and sometimes we don't have direct data for what we are looking at, but we can indirectly do the comparison between uh, our um, subject of interest and uh, what others have found. You have common drugs in different studies, but you can match all those different. So, for example, from what I remember, you have this new drug A, and you want to compare it with C, B, and D. Um, and then you have comparisons between C and B, uh, C and D, B and D. Oh, yeah, for sure. Thank you. Uh, no problem. So, you don't have this uh, directly, but for example, you only have A to B. Okay? But here, you see B is better than C. And since A B is also better than C, so you can conclude that B is better than the other one. You, you don't want to. Yeah, you don't have it directly. You have 
one direct comparison for one of the pairs that you want, for the others you don't. But with this one, you can, uh, you, or with those ones, you can get to this one. Hope it makes sense. Does it? I can try again. <laughs> okay, no problem. Okay, so the steps that we take, Julia is gonna walk you through all of them in lab session, but as always, we have data collection and normalization of the data, standardization of the data. Since we are this, for sure, we are collecting data from different sources because we are looking at different studies. So it's absolutely important to make sure that uh, the drug names, gene names, sample names, everything that we are comparing are comparable, right? Second is effect size calculation. So um, you get the effect size, concordance index or correlation from different studies, but how confident can you be that the effect size that was calculated in one study is comparable with another study? Maybe one study was done only on 10 samples, the other one on 1,000 samples. Is it fair to compare them? That's when you have uh, two models, two types of effect size. Uh, in the first one, we call it fixed effect size, meaning that you are assuming that all the studies involved in your meta-analysis have the same uh, heterogeneity, meaning in terms of sample size, in terms of the age, sex, all the other factors of the samples included, in, included in the data set are comparable. But that rarely happens, right? The other one is random effect size, meaning that you consider that heterogeneity in your analysis. And there are a few um, metrics to help us to measure that, which I'm gonna go through in the next slide. So that's effect size calculation. We need to do that to be able to interpret our results. And also um, when we combine effect sizes from different studies, uh, sometimes we associate weights to our studies. Uh, again, just like I said, based on, based on how, how much confidence you have in the person who did the analysis. Is it coming from a known labs? Something like that. So if you want to emphasize on one study and give it more importance, you can, okay, you can assign weights to that study. And lastly, obviously, we interpret the results considering all the factors that might be affecting our analysis. Any questions here? Are we good? Okay, cool. Okay, here's an example again. Julia is gonna walk you through it uh, more in more depth, but I'll try my best here. Okay, imagine we have gene one, drug one, we calculated their association from using data from these three p-sets. And we found that uh, in this p-set, GDSC2, concordance um, index is 0.82. It's pretty good. And we have a concordance index from two other p-sets as well. And we have the standard errors from all of those studies as well. In R, we will use this metagen meta um, function to do the meta-analysis. So our data is this one, effect size, standard error from the combined data, and then TE is effect size. It can be anything. In, in this case, in this example is concordance index. It's some, in some studies as um, risk ratio or um, even Pearson correlation. So anything that you measured to um, evaluate that relationship. And then the standard errors from each of the studies. And of course, the, here we have this data set that has uh, all the p-sets we are seeing uh, stratified by this column, which is p-set name. And then you get the results. This result shows, just like I said, in meta-analysis, we have this, we increase the power of our uh, results. 
Here is the total effect that this model calculated based on the input data from three different p-sets. So in total, the effect size is going to be 0.83. Because we had the input was concordance index, we can use the same interpretation uh, to interpret that. This is the total effect size, and this is a p-value. Any questions? OK, great. The way that we visualize the results from uh, meta-analysis is usually through forest plots. I'm going to walk you through one of them. So for example, here we have um, sorry, input from three p-sets. These are all p-sets from our uh, package. These are the effect sizes. Whatever they are can be uh, confidence intervals or correlation, standard errors, uh, lower upper um, confidence intervals, and p-values. They put them in the mm, formula that I showed in the previous slide, and we get the total effect. Uh, we, as just like I said, we have to when we want to interpret the results, we have to consider heterogeneity uh, across uh, the p-sets. These metrics here are what help us to do that. Um, so the bigger they are, the higher the heterogeneity. I squared is um, reported based on percentage. So zero means everything's the same, no heterogeneity. Closer to 100, super heterogeneous. Um, usually it's when it's lower than 50%, we say it's mostly homogeneous. Upper than that, it's more heterogeneous. Same um, principle goes for tau and also for chi-squared, they, they might call it just q. So if you saw somewhere they say q, uh, that also shows q test is also a measure of heterogeneity. So based on that, we decide which of the overall effects we want to look at. Uh, the fixed effect, uh, they also call it common effect, or random effect. Because here, all of the metrics are suggesting that we have a high heterogeneity across experiments, uh, across the studies, we might want to go with random effect, and we want to use that as our total effect. And we have some box in, uh, in this um, random forest. We have some boxes, and then uh, you can see the effect size for, for each of this, these studies. And then what you really want to look at towards the end is the total effect. And as you can see, random effect is chosen by default by the model because of the heterogeneity that was seen uh, across the data sets. Any questions? Are we good? OK, great. I kind of walk you through that. But just again, we have Q tests or chi-square tests that um, is sort of a yes or no. Is there heterogeneity across the data sets? Yes or no. And then we have I-square statistic that is in percentage and shows the variation uh, due to heterogeneity across data sets. And then we talked about fixed effects and random effects. And we said that heterogeneity is what helps us decide which ones to choose. OK. So now we were looking at different studies, different data sets uh, to make a conclusion. But say we have a data set. We have a pan cancer um, drug response. Oh, yes, sure. The SE. SE? Mm -hmm. Here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This one is from uh, this specific uh, data analysis from there? Yeah, so the input is um, confidence interval for, from each study. Oh, yeah, sorry. Concordance index from each study and standard error from that study. So in this table here, right? Is that your question? Yeah, so what mm -hmm. 
How is it analyzed? Yes. The confidence that that is Con is concordance index REI. Mm -hmm. See that from uh, here, like BDSC two all these things. Mm -hmm. and also BN, that's the 5.05, and the number of samples. So this SE is calculated from mm -hmm. where? When we were, uh, remember in the morning, we had two variables and gene expression, drug response data from different cell lines, and we were calculating concordance index or correlation, and the model would give us standard error. That's exactly from that. So we did it one by one uh, on different p-sets, and now we are um, trying to use all the p-sets to prove our point. If we want to do a meta analysis, mm -hmm. we can publish the paper data, right? So mm -hmm. we have gathered data like concurrence index or whatever the estimations and everything. Let's say also a drug trial, right? Mm -hmm. The 10 papers did one drug trial for a trust, you know, and they found a kind of a variation of results, right? And right. I want to do a meta analysis for those 10 papers obtaining data from their uh, publication. Or whatever they have the data in their table or whatever it is, right? That's uh, this is a hazard which you would want to mm -hmm. a comparison between the stat and in our uh, meta analysis for that, right? So, how, how can I do that? Okay, uh, it's following the same concept of your uh, analysis. Mm -hmm. or it a difference? There are, I think, we might be talking about two different things. Sometimes 10 papers have done some experiments and you want to use all of those experiments to make a bigger data set to study that data set. Mm -hmm. That is what we do in when we make p-sets from different papers and put it in a data set. But sometimes 10 studies uh, compare the correlation between a gene and a drug and they all reported a concordance index and the standard error. Now we want to gather all those papers to say, based on all of that, we have a bigger number. We have a more robust analysis to um, sort of confirm that that relationship between that gene and drug is actual. That's meta-analysis. So that, that could be the formula that you are using here is a similar like kind of uh, What do you mean? Because we have to calculate this uh, uh, like effect side, right? Effect side. Mm -hmm. And then we will also get some statistical, uh, statistical information from the analysis, right? And mm -hmm. then we want to plot the forest plot from those right. Things, right? That mm -hmm. here, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So the 10 studies that you're talking about, do you have the data or is it? It is published data. It's published data. Let's say they published in five different journals, 10 different journals, right? I collated all this information mm -hmm. uh, based on their author or something like that, right? And we chose some of the key data points, let's say of the survival data points, let's say that hazard issue one paper is uh, reporting that this hazard is probably drug is 0 0.07. Mm -hmm. the same study, did the trial and published in Lancet that said that the hazard ratio for this drug is 1.23, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Now, considering those hazard ratio for these 10 papers, we want to make a meta analysis. Yeah. Exactly. So, yes. So, you can only do it if the 10 studies have the same fact size measurements, so they're all hazard ratio, and they all have the hazard ratio and standard error, then you can do it. If you get the studies use different metrics, then you can't do it because the meta analysis is trying to find one sort of metric. Um, using size of the, the magnitude of the metric and then the standard errors to sort of measure that variance. And then it outputs this one value that sort of think of it like you integrated um, final value combined all the same together. So if the 10 papers have the same metric, you can do it. 
if the paper is really stiff metrics, you can't combine it with anything. Unless you have the raw data and it's costing you some, and then you get the metrics for some. Of this data, that that will give you the product. That just give you the uh, final analysis. That yeah. will be. Uh, there are so many uh, uh, meta analysis people always done, like combining three hundred papers. Yeah. There, and then out of that three hundred papers, they choose for twenty papers, right? Yeah. And then they do the meta analysis to give something more information. Combining these three hundred twenty papers, right? Yeah. So that. We follow the same procedures like we are reporting here today, and then for other meta analysis. Yes, but so I think sometimes usually what people do is they process the data themselves so that when you're comparing all the metrics, not only is it the same metric, but it was generated using the same methods and codes and parameters and whatnot. Um, but I guess like a messy way to do it is if everyone publishes their hazards ratio. You know, that, that, that's the package on metaphor, right? That is very good for. This kind of meta analysis, right? So we are not using meta for today for this analysis today. Um, it's under the same like umbrella package, so um, it's all under meta, but then this is meta and then there's also a bunch of other ones. You have to pick the one that works for the bunch of things. Yeah, but twins, um, you are absolutely right. I have seen many meta analysis that people use hazard ratio relative risk and odds ratio and things like that. So they are the most common ways to do it. Here, we are you know, looking at concordance index correlation because in the context of drug response analysis. But you can do that too. Just like I said, for those meta-analysis, that's exactly how people do it in, for, in the pharma world. Okay. So this time, instead of looking at different studies, we want to stratify our data in terms of, say, specific tissue type. Um, we looked at a, this is just a refresher, we looked at a PCA uh, from one study that looked like this, and we could see clusters uh, that are influenced by tissue type. So we can just stratify our data, focus on one tissue type, and study the associations that we are interested in, in based on cancer-specific or tissue-specific uh, level. Also, sometimes instead of just looking at, we are, say we are doing pan cancer analysis, uh, instead of looking at, uh, so we are interested in uh, all the cancer types, but in, uh, this time we want to see if there is a difference between different sexes, or uh, we want to stratify based on age. Uh, so there are different ways that we can subgroup our uh, one study, or even when we combine different studies and just look at different uh, factors that are different, that are causing differences and stratifying our findings. Uh, we will have uh, some analysis in for this in the workshop, and we will cover this in more depth. And now I'll pass it to Julia, if there are no questions. Okay. Um, we're going to switch gears a bit from here. So this next part, this next portion is going to be a very brief introduction to machine learning for biomarker discovery. I uh, just want to disclose, we're not going to go over the methods. We're not sort of going to go over the nitty gritty. This is just to give you a glance of sort of after everything that you've picked up from this workshop, what are the next sort of big steps um, in terms of going into more advanced analyses for predicting drug response? So sort of a higher level overview, we've shown this slide multiple times throughout the workshop, um, but as you remember, there's multiple different modeling approaches. So you can do univariable, you can do multivariable, and then even within that, there's linear um, and nonlinear combinations of features. And then you also have multimodal, where you have that multivariate, but now your variables may not necessarily be the same feature type. So maybe you have mutations plus clinical data plus like radiomics, um, things like that. 
So up until, sorry, up until now, um, we've covered univariable and we also sort of talked about some linear combinations of features in a multivariate approach. So if you recall that linear model from module three at the very end, we had multiple gene features. Um, we also talked about signatures or sort of computing um, tumor mutational burden, for example. That is also an example of this linear multivariate approach. So now I'm gonna be talking about the remainder of what's out there and that's gonna be nonlinear combinations of features um, and also multimodal features. And if we sort of look at the um, sort of scale here, what we've been doing so far has been looking at simple predictors. We're now gonna talk about how do we build these models and these methods for finding these more complex predictors. So before I get into that, very brief introduction to machine learning. Who here has heard about machine learning? Maybe a raise of hands. Yeah, I figured. So machine learning, it's really taking over everything, but um, it's sort of sometimes a bit hard to understand. Simplest term is it's sort of the idea of training a model to learn something without actually explicitly telling it or programming it to learn. So the model learns from your data by itself. There's two main strategies. There's more, I'm just gonna cover these two. The first is supervised learning. And this is the idea of you give the model some data and you have some labels associated with it. And then the model learns using that data um, with those labels. So this is something called, it's sort of considered task driven. So imagine in the context of drug response, if you have all this patient data, um, so with every patient you have like genomic data, for example, you also have labels of if they're a responder or not responder to a drug. So that's the label. You give the model this information and you tell them we want to predict response and non-response. And then now the model learns from the genomic data and tries to find patterns in that to stratify into these labels that you're giving it. Um, in the unsupervised learning, it's a little less of a direct method for drug response predictions. The idea here is you give the model the data, but there's no labels. And the model is purely just looking at the patterns and trying to figure out um, things without actually having explicit like ideas of what's going on within the data. So imagine you give it the patient data, the model finds like, okay, like this is a pattern that we're seeing in this cluster of patients. This is another pattern that we're seeing in another group of patients. Um, and there's no sort of direct label of these are responders or non-responders, but maybe within these subgroups that the model is identifying, we can later find out that, okay, this group that the model identified is actually correlated with a high response to a given drug, just based on the sort of biological factors that the model was able to pick up. So this, um, approach is sort of more data-driven in that sense. Again, there's more, but I'm just gonna um, touch on these two. And we're actually gonna focus on the first one because it's a bit more direct to what we're talking about. Um, so just very brief overview. When you're doing supervised learning, there's some components when you're putting in your data, you need that input data. Um, it has to be numerical or categorical. Um, something that represents a feature that you're trying to get the model to use um, to make those predictions. So in this case, it could be your RNA-seq expression matrix, mutations, um, any features like that. And then those labels. So in this case, it's gonna be some sort of classification or some sort of metric that measures that drug response. So it could be AUC values like we've been using. If you're doing patient data, it could be outcome data. Um, if you're doing mice models, it could be something like M-resist, um, just things like that. So very simple machine learning algorithms for drug response. And these are actually things that we've already covered in the lab surprise. Um, so the first one is a linear regression. It's a very simple model, just YM X plus B, and it's able to sort of model the association between a feature and a drug. You use this if you have continuous outcome variables, and we actually briefly explained it earlier. Um, there's also something called logistic regression. It's the same idea, but this time if you're trying to model for a binary um, class of an, a dependent variable. So now maybe it's responder status. So you're either a responder or a non-responder. And then the model predicts it um, using the sigmoid function where it's sort of thresholding who the responders will be and who the non-responders will be. Just two different methods. There's a few other ones, but these are some very simple ones that um, you may or may not have already used. Um, so it's a pretty good example to bring up. And I guess um, something I want to point out is there's sort of this notion of, oh, we want to make the more complex models, we want to make the bigger models, um, the ones that take up all the GPUs, but there's actually a lot of very successful um, models and papers out there that use a bit more simpler methods, and so you don't necessarily have to always think bigger, cooler model. Um, you can get away with very great results using a more simplistic model, and you can even argue that when you're trying to translate into the clinic, 
using simpler approaches may be better because then you're sort of taking out all that complexity that might get convoluted when you're dealing with patient data. So here's a really cool example. I should have prefaced that um, for the next bit, I'll be pulling out some really cool models from the literature, just to sort of give examples of what's happening in the field. So here's one really cool um, model. It's a logistic model. It's a bit it's a bit more fancy than a regular logistic model, but it uses the same sort of structure. Um, and this one, what it does is it's a multi, multi-modal model. Um, it has six different features, and I believe the features were, um, I think it was like tumor mutation of burden. I think there was some clinical data, so whether or not they had some sort of treatment. Um, there was some blood protein measurements. Um, I think the last, the last one might have been age or something. But anyway, it uses these six features, and it generates a signature called Boris. And this, what's really cool about this is, first of all, it was evaluated in over 2,800 patients, which is a crazy amount of patient data. They combine a huge amount of cohorts. Um, it performed really, really well um, in predicting immunotherapy response. A few other things is their approach was to test a bunch of different relevant features. Um, and they sort of did that feature selection to figure out what the best ones were to derive the signature that was comprehensive, but also um, not too complex. And they also compared it with 20 other machine learning models. And if I remember correctly, they did um, some smaller ones like the student trees, and I think they did SVM. They also compared it to a deep neural network, which is like a really complex model. Um, and this one actually outperformed it. So the sort of take home message here is um, the approach is really good, but then also you don't always have to go too complex um, to do a prediction task. You can sort of stick to the simpler models. And as long as you do the correct training, use the right data, you can still develop really strong model or predictor. Um, here's another really cool example that um, I took, and this one was published, I think, it, it might have been this year. Um, but what they did here was um, they have a multiomic predictor for breast cancer treatment, um, and they built it using mutations, copy numbers, which is another genomic alteration, um, RNA-seq expression, as well as digital pathology. Um, so what they did was they started with univariate tests for drug associations, which is exactly what we've been covering in modules um, three. And then once they sort of identified the key features, then they built a bit more of a complex model. They basically combined a bunch of machine learning models, and they were able to, again, have these really strong predictions. They validated in um, an external data set. Everything held um, really accurate results. Um, and so this was another example of a really successful application of first a univariate, and then they built the model out of it. Okay, so those were sort of examples of, actually I should preface, the models they used here, it was ensemble, but it was still a combination of relatively simple models. So now we go into deep learning and um, through a show of hands, who here has heard of deep learning? Okay, cool, fewer hands. So deep learning in the simplest way is a subset of machine learning um, and it's based on neural networks. And what a neural network is, is it's a model that sort of tries to do um, predictions and it's designed to mimic the way that your brain works. Um, and if I can sort of try to explain it in the easiest way, I guess something to think about is if I give you a task, so if I say, um, if I give you an apple or a shape of an apple, and I tell you, can you tell me if this is an apple or a pear? And you can tell immediately it's an apple, but can you tell why you know it's an apple? And usually when you think about it that way, you can't actually identify what the exact features are that sort of tell you it's an apple, you just know it's an apple. Um, but in your head, what's happening is you have all these neurons and they're firing different patterns. And through that patterns, through these like things that the neurons have learned through this years of growing up and eating apples and pears, you have some sort of connection in your brain that is able to map out, given some features of what you're looking at on an apple, you can tell if it's an apple or a pear. Um, let me see if I can put it into this. So some features that you may notice in an apple, maybe the color, maybe the shape, maybe the texture, these are all sort of primary input features that you can put in. Um, but then within your brain, it's like, depending on the, the pigment, for example, it could fire different ways. So a brighter red versus like a paler red that could be confused with like green or yellow, fires in different ways, activates different neurons. And then through those combinations of firing with the other variables as well, it keeps firing and firing through different layers um, and eventually it comes out in some sort of combination where you can say, okay, I know this is an apple because it fired through so many different um, variables almost. I hope that makes sense. Did that make sense? 
Okay. Um, but essentially what I'm trying to say is when you feed in the neural network, you're gonna feed it some features. So maybe here we're feeding it some gene expression um, values. And then based on each of these gene expression values, um, it will fire into this hidden layer and it sort of fires through different neurons in a way that we can't actually understand. But for the model, it's finding these features within your data um, that, they, that the model is able to sort of use to make the prediction. And at the very end, based on the combination of firing, um, it can sort of come out with an output. So maybe the output is either responder or non-responder. Um, so yeah, this is a really powerful method um, for machine learning, but the problem here, as you can imagine, is interpretability, because we don't actually know what the primary features are, and we can't actually understand the features because it's simply just a combination of neurons being fired with the weights and everything. Um, and that's why I wanted to bring up this model because it's an example of a deep learning um, neural network, but what's really cool about it is it's actually interpretable. So the way they or sort of designed the neural network is it follows the biological hierarchies of the mutations um, or protein assemblies in your body. So the way how, if you have these mutations and the mutations are sort of related to a subprocess and these subprocesses sort of builds into this huge um, signaling pathway, for example, that's sort of what's happening here. Um, and it overall comes down to predicting, this was response to um, CDK46 inhibitors. So what they sort of put into this model is um, these mutation calls, and depending on which mutations or which genes are mutated, what type of mutation it is, it fires into, okay, this mutation on this gene is here, this gene is related to this process here, which is related to this here, um, and it goes into your response. Once you get your response, you can actually sort of backtrack and see, okay, like this, this was activated, this was activated, um, you can see the weights. And so the example that they gave was with their CDK46 inhibitor prediction, we know that CD 4K, um, these kinases are involved in cellular proliferation. And so they actually found that the sub-processes that were sort of um, being activated were the ones related to cell cycle control. And they were able to sort of um, validate this with CRISPR knockout as well. So this was really cool because it sort of brings us into this realm of maybe we can now leverage deep learning models for these biological processes while actually understanding what the biological mechanisms driving these predictions is. Okay, what time is it? <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so those are just some sort of full examples from the literature. We just wanted to give you guys an idea of what's out there and sort of what's happening in the field. Um, I do wanna end by talking about the challenges in machine learning, specifically for precision oncology. And this goes beyond machine learning already has so many problems with just complexity and overfitting and all these things. But when we're specifically talking about predicting drug response for patients, there's a lot of sort of other considerations that have to come to play. First is we have to navigate the risk and rewards ratio. If we're doing a machine learning task for, oh, predict an apple between apple and pear, if I get it wrong, it's not that big a deal. But if we're putting a patient's life um, on the line, and we're training a model to sort of make a prediction that will either give them this life-saving therapeutic drug or giving them a drug that will possibly be toxic. Um, obviously, you can see the difference between the risk and the reward. And so sometimes I guess you can say that um, the translatability has that limitation in the case of how much can we trust this AI model versus trusting a doctor. Um, and that's one of the biggest sort of like hurdles in translating these models into the clinic. Um, another thing is that these algorithms really have to be robust, fair, and reliable. This sort of all makes sense, but when you think about sort of the data that's been collected historically, there is a bias for certain groups of people. And so if you take these models that were trained on this sort of data and we bring into a clinic and we have patients coming in that may or may not fit into that sort of common group profile, um, you can see the implications that could happen um, down the line. Another thing that sort of makes this a bit challenging is the fact that when you're trying to train these models, if you're trying to use patient data, for example, patient data is very limited and very scarce. And what's more is you may have the patient data, but you may not have all the data that you need to actually train the model. So maybe you don't have all the sort of um, sequencing data. Maybe you don't have the clinical data. Collecting all this data is really expensive and doctors are already very overworked. And so you can see why um, it is very sort of difficult to obtain. But as sort of machine learning gets bigger and bigger, there is a bigger push to sort of collect this data and do the all the sequencing. And so we're seeing improvements on this front. Um, that is also why 
some of these models that I've shown and models in the papers have been being trained on cell line data um, because we have so many and it's a bit cheaper to sort of do these experiments. But then the problem again is sort of taking models that are trained on cell lines, does it work on patients? It sometimes doesn't, sometimes it does. And then the very last thing is, I, and I guess I talked about this, the diversity in patient populations. Um, I guess we can talk about it again because it's a really important concept, but models trained on one data um, source may not necessarily generalize to others. So maybe if you have um, a group in some, say like Finland, and they train their model on the data that came into their institution, um, you probably can't take that model and apply it to patients in Toronto because the demographic here is a lot different than the ones in Finland. Any questions on um, any of that that I talked about? Cool. Okay. Um, that actually brings us to the end of module four and I guess the last lecture for um, this workshop. We did end a bit early, so I think we can actually go ahead and, or do we want to wait for the group photo?